Also say happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Also, I want to encourage you fathers to make sure that you say a word of encouragement to the sons and daughters that God's given you. And make that a habit, make that a priority in your life. Uh, no matter what age or stage your kids may be and how difficult they might be, sometimes kids can be difficult. Have you all ever noticed that? <laughs> I had one of my uh, sons was visiting a few uh, a week or two ago, and looked at me and says, Dad, you're looking old. <laughs> that from the heart, man. <laughs> Boy, do you want to grow old? Um, <laughs> but, but be an encourager. Be that place where affirmation can be found. And rise above any of the hurt that might be there from things in the past. And ask God to love your children through you, even, even if it's not reciprocated well. Last week, I left you with Moses part one, and today Moses is having a comeback. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an unpopular take this morning, and I hope some of you don't change churches over it, and that is I'm not into golf. I, kn I know, I know, that's heartbreaking. I'm about to make some Methodists out of y'all here, <laughs> but I'm not anti, I just, there's only so many things you can like, and I think, I, I didn't get into it because my father didn't really play it, and I remember a few times that it was on the TV at home, and I would, I would walk past it going, what, that looks so boring, what is going on? I like to watch football, I like to watch basketball, and I'm like, this is a little low on action, I will tell you that much. So. I will let you know that in all of my years, I have only seen golf on TV, uh, except for those little moments in passing through, one time. I only watched, and I only basically saw one hole of golf. <laughs> but you might say it's the most significant, or the, uh, the most, yeah, I think those who are real golfers could disagree, but from what I heard and what I have read, I saw the most significant hole of golf in golf history, and that is the 2019 Masters. I was, I forget what else I was doing, but I was looking on an app, on a sports app or something, and everywhere I looked, everyone was talking about the Masters, and I'm like, you know what, maybe it can't be that bad. And so I, I turned it on, and it was the, either the end of the 17th hole or the 18th hole, and Tiger Woods was having a historic comeback. Um, to say that Tiger had a few challenges along the way in life is an understatement. Uh, he, of course, stormed on the scene, was uh, the best golfer in the world by 1997, and won tournament after tournament, went through some personal challenges, went through a lot of physical challenges, and when he was coming back, he really was a shell of the Tiger of the 90s. And... This was the moment where he entered into the last day of golf behind, two strokes behind, and he was essentially behind to the very end. And then the folks in front of him began to do poorly, and he began to make all the right shots. And of course, I, I loved his last shot and the joy that everyone had, and him picking up his little son. I'm a sucker for people that pick up their little kids and hug them. And I was like, man, this ain't so bad. Then I thought to myself, I think I'm done, though. I think I've had all I want. <laughs> uh, I may watch it again if there's another cool one hole like that. But I think, uh, I think in our culture, we're drawn into something we may not know much about, we may not normally like, if there's a good comeback story. I think we're a sucker for a comeback story. And in Moses' life, we see today... A, a spiritual comeback. And as we look at Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7 and dive more into the story of Moses, we can learn some of our own principles about how to have a spiritual comeback in our life. Maybe you need a comeback in every area of your life. You've strayed far and God's not finished with you and he wants you to come back to him and you can have by his grace a spiritual comeback. For others, it may not be a full comeback. Maybe there's an area in your life or two that you've sort of put 
to the side spiritually. And God's really wanting you to come back to him with this struggle in this area. And we should note that the context of these words today are once again in the long speech or sermon of Stephen, who is preaching for his life before the Sanhedrin. And he's walking through aspects of the the story of Israel to show a couple of things. One, he's speaking about Moses because they assumed he hated Moses because he began to preach about Christ was the fulfillment of one of Moses' prophecy. And he basically shows himself as very pro-Moses when seen in the right context. And there's other themes that Stephen's sermon contained that we'll highlight again today. But I want to first of all read verse 30 of Acts chapter 7 about how to have a spiritual comeback. And it says this, Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. So this is a reference to Exodus chapter 3, the great story of Moses and the burning bush. Uh, We saw that last week he ran away from the life of luxury in Egypt. He was accused of, and uh, truly accused, actually accused of killing uh, an Egyptian. And so the Israelites didn't like him. And the Hebrews, um, the, the Egyptians were now turning on him. And so he ran away to the desert. And he's there for some 40 years. And this is the end of his Midian journey. Uh, And God appears to him in a burning bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now, the first principle this morning about how to have a spiritual comeback is number one, and that's this, to keep an exalted view of God. So you, we see a bush that is burning, but we, we find in Exodus 3, the bush is not consumed. I would imagine that it was not an unlikely sight in the desert of Midian, in the, in the hot heat of the desert, that there were small fires that would happen to dry bushes. And, but this scene was different. As Moses walked past it, he noted that the bush was burning, but it was not being burnt up. It wasn't consumed. And so he drew near. He stopped to look. And there are some that want to see symbolism in the bush itself. Some have ventured to say maybe the bush is referring to the nation of Israel. They were burned in the trials of their servitude and slavery, but the power of God enabled them to keep alive, and they were burned but not consumed. And that's a possibility. Some say that maybe the bush was a a bramble or a a thorn type of bush, and the thorns represent the thorns, uh, the crown of thorns on Christ's head, and it represents that Christ's death and his burning, but he was not consumed by his death because he rose in victory. That's possible as well. But one of the things we can never be too strong on are read-ins to the text with symbolism. Um, Oftentimes, the the Bible does use symbolic language, and sometimes it's very obvious. Sometimes we're even told what the symbolism means. In this case, I don't think we should push too hard for some type of symbolism. I think what God is doing is simply going out of his way to get Moses' attention. Now, Moses was taught about the one true God, and he had that point at the end of his time in Egypt where he was wanting to be identified with his own people instead of the people of Egypt. He was a Hebrew at heart. He had likely been taught that there weren't many gods, but there was one true God, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you can imagine he married someone in the desert of Midian and likely from a pagan background. And it's possible that Moses has strayed from God again. And God went out of his way to get his attention. I think that's the point of the story uh, at at this moment. And I wonder if you've had some burning bushes in your life where God has gone out of his way to get your attention. And maybe, maybe your burning bush has been a trial. Maybe you had some medical or physical disability that really woke you up and got your attention. Maybe sometimes... God's burning bushes are blessings that he wants us to see that these blessings came from him and that we should 
treasure and steward these blessings in a way that honors him. Maybe God's burning bush sometimes is his silence. And sometimes God's burning bush in our lives might be deep and great conviction of the Holy Spirit upon our heart. But whatever God does to get your attention, make sure that you give him your attention. And so he turns and begins to come toward the burning bush, and God says, don't come any further. And we read a summary of what he said, essentially, when he says, I am the God of your fathers, in verse 32, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Essentially, the Lord says to him, I am God. And Moses, you are not. Make sure that you see me for who I really am. You know, God has a great desire in the Bible to be known as God. One of the things that we need to do as we journey through life is not desire to be known for what we've accomplished, what we've done, what we possess. We are who we are by the grace of God. Anything we have in our life is the, is the strict mercy of God. We are recipients of his grace. We don't need to be somebody to the world. We are, we are so blessed and honored to be known by him and to have a relationship with him. But God is God is the exalted one. He knows that, and he knows the best thing for us in life is to acknowledge that. So he goes to great lengths in the Word of God to remind us that he is God. There's nothing wrong. There, it, it, there's a rightness about God's desire to be known as God and a wrongness about our desire to be known as someone. Our greatest identity should be our identity in God. We read Moses saying later in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4, Verse 39, it says, Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. God's desire to be known as God should be a great desire of our hearts that we would never forget his greatness. We would never forget who he is. We would stand in awe of him. And so Moses was reminded of the exalted position of God. And in verse 33, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet. I was going to visit the house of one of our staff members recently, and they at their there's a doormat uh, on their in front of their door, and it says "cute shoes." Then it says, "Now take them off." <laughs> They're one of those barefoot homes, and I uh, I don't think that God is saying "cute sandals, Moses." Now take them off <laughs> in the same way. Why does he, we're not told exactly why he says to take off your sandals here, but sandal, being shoeless was the plight of servants back in the day. In our day, shoes are common for anybody regardless of their income. There's certainly nicer shoes for the more wealthy people, but if you had no shoes in that day, it was a sign that you were either a slave or a servant in some house, or that you were extremely poor. And I think that as God reminds Moses of who God is, of who he is, he wants Moses to realize, you are my servant. So take off your sandals and remember your role as a servant. He's about to ask Moses to do the unthinkable for him, go back to Egypt. Well, there was a lot of bad blood between him and Egypt. There was a lot of skeletons in the closet, literally, in him in Egypt. And for him to go back was a huge ask. And it was something that Moses was likely not up for. And so God says, take off your sandals. Remember that you are my servant for my purposes, to do my will. And I have a plan for you. So make sure you have the heart and the mindset and the attitude of a servant. And then he says, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Holy ground? way out in the desert of Midian. Why on earth is holy ground found out there? Now, this was a really big message to the hearers of Stephen's sermon because Stephen's listeners, his congregation that morning, were convinced that God dwelled in Israel, and specifically God dwelled in the temple. That's where the residence of God was. Sometimes we refer to this church or one of our campuses as the house of the Lord but we do so uh, for lack of better terms. God doesn't dwell in here in the Village Park campus, in the downtown campus. He dwells in heaven. He dwells in the hearts of believers. And wherever God is, 
or ever we recognize where God is, that's holy ground. And I, I think it's a reminder. Sometimes, have you ever been a place in your life where you don't like the place that you're living? Not merely the home or the habitation, but maybe it's the phase of life. Maybe it's the actual city or state. You might have gone through a time like that where you're unhappy with those kind of surroundings. And I want to encourage you to ask God for a greater sense of his presence in those moments. Because wherever you are, and if you're a follower of Christ, you know Christ personally, there he is as well. And when you commune with God anywhere, that becomes holy ground. There's a sacredness to any place we are where there is an awareness of the presence of God. And so he was reminding Moses that he was exalted and that Moses was his servant and that God's presence was with Moses there and would be with him everywhere. Now in verse 34 it says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I have heard their groaning and I have come down to deliver them and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This is the message that Moses did not want. He was probably settled in to this new phase of life. I'm sure there was a shock for Moses being going from rich to poor, going from secure to unsecure, and changing professions, having a lowly profession in the culture. But he was probably saying, you know what, I'm ready to sort of ride into the old uh, desert in the sky. My time is finished. And God says, no, you're not finished. I have a, a plan for you. But notice in verse 34 the tremendous personal care of God for Moses. Matter of fact, that's the blank number two, how to have a spiritual comeback number two, and cling tightly to God's personal care for you. It says in verse 34, surely, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I think that sometimes when we're going through affliction, we're wondering if God is looking. Did you see that? Maybe you had, uh, maybe you were on the, the playground back in the day when you were in grade school and someone was mean to you, said something or pushed you or shoved you and the people that should have seen it didn't see it. And the people that mattered, you could tell on your classmates and many times your teacher or your coach may not believe you because they didn't see it and there's no there were no cameras and there's no proof and you're really mad because they didn't see what they should have seen and sometimes because God is spirit we forget that he sees everything and he he does see your pain this morning he does see your hurt he does see any injustice that may have been done to you but sometimes it's not very comforting. Have you ever been to the place in your life where something bad happened to you and someone did see it and they chose to ignore it? That's painful. That's anger inducing when someone sees you but they don't care enough to do anything. Well, God is showing that he goes beyond merely seeing. Notice how it says, I've seen the affliction. And then it says, I have heard their groaning. In other words, God is his eyes are working well, and his ears are working well. Have you ever had a prayer that you've lifted up again and again and again, and it's not being answered in the way that you hoped, and so you assume that God has not heard you, that there's something wrong with God's spiritual hearing? Brothers and sisters, we have to come to grips with it. God doesn't answer prayers just like we wanted him to and just when we wanted him to. And, and, and sometimes our belief in God's love for us hinges upon God doing what we dreamed of and hoped in. And the, the hope is not in our request. It is in God's sovereign will and his sovereign timing. God does what he does in a way that promotes his glory and his timing is perfect. And so don't assume that God is not listening just because things didn't turn out in the same way that you requested. He is now ready to act in Moses' life. And when he's ready to act in your life, you will know it. But be comforted that he does see you and that he does hear you this morning. And then it says, I have come down to deliver them. And, and so he, he sees and he hears, and now he is going to act. God acts on, in behalf of our good, but he does it in a way that is consistent with his perfect timing and perfect plan. 
I hope that you will revel and trust and grow in believing that God cares for you. He's proven his love for you by sending his one and only son to die on the cross for your sins. And so in light of that, there's a backdrop of God's proven love for us in every aspect of our life. My wife, Susie, has two sisters, and she often has long conversations with them on the phone. And I was passing by one day, and it was on the speaker, and I heard one of her sisters say something incredibly profound spiritually. She says, you know, Suze, I am just now learning how much God loves me. And this sister is probably ten, eight or nine years older than Mrs. Lee. And what a beautiful, she didn't know she was going to be in the sermon, or she didn't know that she was giving <laughs> preacher material to me. But I just paused, and I'm like, man, that's an incredible thing to realize, that God loves us, and we're unaware of it sometimes. It's what Paul prayed for the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, when he prayed that you, the eyes of your heart would be enlightened and that you would know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. We have a, a sense of God's love, but it's never big enough. It's never enough. And that's how much you matter to him. Your worth doesn't come by what you do for him. It comes by you grasping his love for you and you understanding what a loving God he is. I was meeting with a resident uh, at our Samaritan Inn, our shelter at the downtown campus recently. And this young man is engaged to another resident, which is, which is exciting. And his fiance has a son who is severely autistic. And I was saying, hey, you know, you're taking on a responsibility here. How are you relating to her children? And he says, uh, she has two sons, one of them with that condition. And he says, I, I love the boys. And he says, I have learned that when her son has an autistic episode, that all he needs... He is triggered by different sounds and sights and things, and so he, he gets upset. And all he wants to know is that everything is going to be okay. And so as soon as he has an autistic episode, I, if I'm near him, I grab his hand, and he calms down. Or I will hold him and give him a hug, and he completely calms down because he knows that, <clears throat> that everything is going to be okay. And I, I was like, yeah, you're going to be an all right dad. <laughs> What a beautiful thought that the Heavenly Father reaches out to us with His embrace when we are crying, when, we, when, he, when we're groaning, when we are in affliction, when we're in our own Egypt, that all we have to do is to look to Him and He will surround. The Bible says the unfailing love of the Lord surrounds the man who trusts in Him. That's Psalm 32, verse 10. And if you're trusting in God today, he wants to surround you with his love and, and the awareness that, yes, everything is going to be okay. It doesn't mean that there, there will be no trouble, there will be no trial, but it just means that he is here. The backdrop of his love is present, and he wants to draw you in to his embrace. Verses 35 through 38 is a, a series of sort of quick bits about Moses' life. And they are, one of the things that Stephen in this message is trying to do to his listeners is to remind them of how Moses has similarities to Jesus. Because the end of the message next week that we'll see is finally he mentions the Messiah. And he's trying to make parallels of the likeness between Moses and Jesus. And in verse 35, he says, This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both a ruler and a redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. So one of the ways that Moses is like Jesus Christ is that Moses was initially rejected by his people. and was actually rejected again and again in the wilderness era. Jesus of Christ came to his people and they received him not. They rejected him. And it, it also says who appeared to him in the bush by the hand of an angel at the end of verse 35. And there is a similarity within the wilderness 
when Jesus was tempted by Satan, there were, the, the Bible says that angels came to minister to him. In verse 36, it says, This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt. Christ, of course, in the Gospel of Matthew as a boy, also went to Egypt. And then it says, At the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. The Red Sea parting is the Exodus, the greatest miracle of the Old Testament, and it was God leading his people on dry ground through the Red Sea. Many say that the Exodus is a parallel to the resurrection in the New Testament. God provided a way for his people to come to their destination through him, and Christ, through the resurrection, paved the way for us to cross over into eternal life to the Lord through that. Verse 37 and 38, it says this, This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Now the third principle this morning about how to have a spiritual comeback is keep a forward look to the person of Christ. You know, Christ for us as believers, he's already come, but we are to be looking for him in this life. We are to be looking for his help, his aid, and his presence everywhere. We're also to look forward to his return. But did you notice Stephen quoting in verse 37 an ancient Old Testament passage? He's quoting Deuteronomy 18:15, where it says, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. So who is the quote, prophet like me? So Moses said that, that one day there's going to be a prophet like me from your brothers. Many feel that this is, of course, a messianic prophecy. Christ is more than a prophet to be sure. But there is a similarity between much of what Moses went, went through and what Jesus went through. And Stephen is trying to say, you may have been able to quote Deuteronomy, but do you know that it has a fulfillment? The other prophets that came, they, they came and they also spoke to the one who would come. You rejected them, but I, I want you to know there's a deeper fulfillment of, of this phrase, and the fulfillment is now perfectly fulfilled in Christ. So in the first century, they were looking for Jesus. They need to open their eyes to, to realize it was him. He had come. He'd gone into heaven. He'll come back to take those who are his to be with him forever. And if you want to have a spiritual comeback, you have to look to the person of Christ, and you have to look for him. Now in verse 39, our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. I don't know if you've ever um, been reading through the Bible and much of Exodus is hard to read. Uh, some of it is a bit on the monotonous side in, in terms of some aspects of how they were going to build the tabernacle. Verse 30, chapter 32 of Exodus is a very interesting passage. It's, a, it's sort of an uh-oh passage in terms of the spiritual history of Israel. So they'd been through the Red Sea with Moses, and they were journeying toward the land of promise. At least that's what they hoped. They had already been given the Ten Commandments. They had a great sense of God's presence as, they, as Moses went to the mountain. As he delivered the commandments of God, there was an, a sense of awe about that moment. And now Moses was on the top of Mount Sinai again, and he had been there. They he'd been basically taken up in a cloud um, over a month ago. For some 40 days, he'd been up there. And they didn't think at this point he'd, he was coming back. There was a delay in Moses' return as far as they're concerned. His brother Aaron, who we're going to find out was not a very fit spiritual leader. And the people were getting restless. By the way, how do you respond to the delays of God? Because the delay of God and the people of Israel was one of the worst things about their entire history. That God had not shown up according to their plan, and so they got restless, and they began 
to create their own gods. They began to substitute the God because, their, because the God hadn't shown up in a way that they liked. And so they got restless and they, in their minds, they had passed through the streets of Cairo, Egypt, over and over again for generations. And they began to sort of take in the gods of Egypt. And they worshipped um, cows. They worshipped calves. And they had idols made out to be calves. And they're basically, in their restlessness, they went to Aaron and said, Hey, where's Moses? Well, I'm not sure. I know, brother, he takes his time on things. He's probably coming back before too long. Look, um, we want to worship. And, and, and in their minds, they justified the idol they made because Aaron said to them, This is your God who delivered you out of Egypt. And they thought they were worshiping the God. Yes, it was forbidden because you aren't to have any graven images of God. God's majesty is too great that to be boiled down into an image. You're not supposed to have a... Uh, your mental image of God should not be portrayed and contained in some metal image. It's not worthy of God. It obscures the glory of God. But they were restless. And so Aaron said, okay, guys, we'll just try something. Why don't you give me your gold? And so everybody came and got all their gold and their earrings and their jewelry, and they gave it to Aaron. By the way, when you develop a substitute for God, it's amazing the devotion we will give to it of our own resources. We are generous to our, quote, idols. We, we spend and spend and spend so much for the things that are a, a cheap, sorry, substitute for God. But Aaron basically says, okay, and so there was we don't exactly know, was it pure gold, the whole calf? It, it likely was a carving of wood that was gold-plated. But regardless, it, they had enough to make this idol look um, like one of the idols of Egypt. And Aaron proclaimed that this was their God. And so they began to bow down and have revelry, have a bunch of revel. And essentially there is an allusion to sexual sin became part of their worship like the pagan nations. And they prostituted themselves before this golden calf. Moses shows up later. It's not in our text here. But Moses shows up later in the midst of this and he is not happy. Uh, on Father's Day, Daddy was not very happy with what was going on with all his little bandit children below the mountain. Now, how can we make something out of this for our own soul today? Well, the fourth principle, how to have a spiritual comeback, is this. Watch out for the lure of counterfeit gods. I have this memory as a kid. There was a missionary child that was in our, that occasionally was in our youth group. Her parents lived in some part of East Asia, and she would come for a few months every few years, and we would, you know, she became part of our youth group and all that stuff. And on the day that she was leaving, a bunch of girls were handing her cash. I'm like, well, that's sweet. They're blessing the missionary. And I was like, what's going on here? And she goes, oh, well, I can get them some really uh, cheap Louis Vuitton purses in Asia. <laughs> and she said, I didn't really know what that was, but uh, apparently they were a big deal, and they were, you can get a genuine fake uh, <laughs> Louis Vuitton purse for about 10 bucks. And they came back, and they were these fancy-dancy Louis Vuitton girls in Fort Worth, Texas. And I didn't go around and spill the beans that they're actually fake, but... Uh, we, of course, we're lured into things that are counterfeit because they have some benefit for us. Sometimes the benefit might be that we get to look and act a certain way, and we, or sometimes there is a financial compensation or a financial ease if we go for the counterfeit. But there are a lot of counterfeit gods. And this kind of thing is difficult for us to be honest with ourselves about because I think we like to, well, if we're eating too much, we always like to say we're one bite away from gluttony. If, uh, if someone is drinking too much, you're a, you're a few sips away from drunkenness and therefore you're okay. And we don't know the line of, when, of what something that we like that is actually good, that is a gift of God, is something that we enjoy and we thank God for or has it become 
a replacement for God to some degree. And I realized that the way we determine if we have a counterfeit God or an idol in our life is by the Holy Spirit revealing to us. But if we have something that we look to when we should be looking to the Lord for, if we have someone or something that we say or think, I have no reason to live without this. My significance comes from this. Or if there's something in your life that you would begin to compromise long-held values for in order to keep this or possess this or have this, I will do anything, that becomes a counterfeit idol. I may have told you before that when I was in a, a Sunday school class one time, the teacher was teaching about idolatry, and he said, he asked a question, and I know that you Sunday school teachers sometimes have a hard time generating class discussion, and it's, it's hard to know the right questions to ask that will generate proper discussion, and this person looked at us and said, do you, any of you have any idols? Well, that's not exactly a friendly Baptist kind of thing. We're like, nah, no, we don't have any idols, you know. I've heard of a few people that have idols, but not us, and it was pretty much crickets chirping until one man raised his hand and he was a wealthy banker in town he goes yeah i have some idols he says for me it's money you could have heard a pin dropper going well tell me more about this idol (laughs) sunday school just got interesting (laughs) but i mean the honesty of that confession just stuck with me and brothers and sisters the counterfeits are cheap the counterfeits don't last. We can act like it's, it's from God, too, just like the people of Israel did. But they became a substitute for God that plummeted their spiritual life. So the blessings that we have in our life, let's make sure that we see them as gifts from God that we thank Him for, that we honor Him with. But when there's that com- competition for the allegiance of our soul. Let's be honest enough to repent of our idols and eager enough to say, Lord, I want this thing to be subservient to my love for you. I want you to be first at all times, no matter what, Lord. And anything that I'm making out to be an idol, I I give it to you. I yield it to you. Well, there's another principle I want to share with you from verse 42 and 43. Moses, or Stephen, in finishing up his thoughts about Moses says one more statement about him and then to make the point he quotes from the old testament book of amos but god turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven a reference to idols as it is written in the book of the prophets did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness O house of israel you took up the tent of moloch he's referencing pagan gods here that the Israelites were worshiping, and the star of your God, Rephan, and images that you made to worship. And I will send you into the exile beyond Babylon. So these are words of judgment that Stephen is reminding his hearers that when you make false gods, and I think that he was trying to imply that they had made a false god out of Moses and out of the temple itself. They had basically made something good from God, a place to worship God, they had made that into God himself. That was their own idol. And in verse 42, there's a chilling intro here. It says, but God turned away. Now we know what it's like for, for, for God to turn to us with his mercy and shine his face of love on us. But what a horrible thing for us to read these words. But God turned away and gave them over. Some of you are going, I don't think we teach that in children's church. God turned away and gave them over. That's not an aspect of God that we're familiar with. Well, I I agree that we're not familiar with it, but I do think we should become more familiar with it. That there is, that God is a God of incredible patience, but there's also a limit to his patience. I don't mean there's a limit to his forgiveness. He will forgive all our failings and we can repent and he will always restore us and come to us, but he also will not play the fool. It does say that there's a point in Israel's disobedience that their repentance was a sham, 
they didn't mean it, and then they ceased doing it. And so for God to turn them over to their sin shows that he is basically no longer giving his restraint to them. Do you ever sense that God, that you would be in so much more trouble if God didn't have his hand on you, his direction, his guidance, and his spirit leading you? Of course we all would. But he is giving them over to their own consequences. Now the difficulty in this is sometimes when God gives us over to our own sin, we enjoy it for a while. Picture a mom of a toddler, maybe a toddler boy who sees some dirt and mud and wants to play in it. And mom is telling him, no, you don't want to go over there. No, you can't go over there. And finally, his insistence, she just says, okay, fine. Just go over there. And the toddler plays in the mud. And the bad news for mom is, guess what? He liked it. He liked it a lot. Now, he's not going to like it when he wants to go back inside and watch cartoons and have a snack. And he can't come in there like that. But a lot of times when God gives us over to our sin, the temporary pleasure of sin, it, we enjoy it for a while. But when God gives us over and there's no longer his sense of conviction or restraint or that sense of God's presence in our lives, then we find ourselves into a deep, dark place. Now, as a, if you're a true believer, God's spirit still remains in you. And if you run for him, uh, God, I believe, will often put the burning bush in your life to awaken you and bring you back to him. That's what God does for those who know him. But for those who hear the word of God and resist it and God gives us over to our own sin, we sometimes fall into a place where we are so distant from his voice that it is highly unlikely that there will be repentance in our life. And this is something we must remember. Are are you gifted at giving God the Heisman and you are pushing him away from speaking to you in areas of your life? Note the the powerful wording of this verse is, Lord, I don't want you to turn away from me. I don't want to be handed over to my sin. We see the horrible results of the sexual perversion that happened in Romans 1, verse 24, when God gave them over to the lust of their flesh. We're basically seeing it lived out in our day, in our own country and nation of God, giving them over to follow the perverse desires of their own heart. This is not something that believers want to be part of our lives. And so sometimes a spiritual comeback happens when we, number five, when we become, when we are aware of testing God's patience. God's patience is to bring us to repentance. It's not for us to abuse his mercy. Maybe you have tested someone's patience. That is generally a patience, per, a very patient person, and you found that there is an end to their patience. Once again, I want to remind you to not forget the other principles of Scripture of God's love and God's willingness to forgive. But this verse speaks for itself when it says that God turned away and gave them over to something. This is not how we want our life to go.